and uh, Alan. We're waiting for a couple more people, but I think we should just go ahead and start, don't you? It's a little after 6.30 your time, 7.30 my time. Um, cheers, Absolutely. everyone. We've got uh, both um, welcome guests and wine team members on, and I think we should all toast to each other's good health. Cute little itty bitty bottle here. Yeah, fa fabulous. Let's hear it for itty bitty bottles. And here's to everyone's courage, generosity, creativity, you know, uh, good cheer in the face of God knows what you're dealing with, uh, stamina, <laughs> everything yeah. over the last almost nine months. It's just been uh, an, an extraordinary time uh, by anybody's measure. And I sure appreciate your company. And, you know, these Zoom tastings have been um, really an intimate welcome relief because my favorite part about them is nobody's in the back of the room, right? Um, yes. There's something wonderful about that. I just love it. So cheers, everyone. Cheers. Uh, cheers. Individual and collective good health marching into 2021, right? Mm. Um, so full disclosure... Um, this is an intimate tasting tonight, but that's okay. Ah, cheers, Irene. We've got the chat room going, which uh, we'll all keep an eye on. We're waiting for a couple more people, so I'll keep a, a, an eye on the waiting room. But um, this is uh, a small group, which is terrific. We can all relax and enjoy ourselves, right? I am drinking the champagne in front of me, and I am notorious <laughs> about uh, not doing that, <laughs> but... I don't have to drive anywhere. I just have to walk downstairs for dinner. Um, full disclosure is I do not have the champagnes in Chicago because I'm sitting in Michigan. But what are I you drinking? I'm drinking Charles Heitzig Rosé Reserve, which we Ooh, should Ooh, well, we will be discussing a little night. bit, Charles yes. Heitzig. And I have a Champagne Charlie uh, glass with a little bow tie on it because oh. it came in the gift box, you know, but it's actually very... Very good. <laughs> so yay. Um, what else? Just to go over a couple things. If you haven't poured your champagne, go for it, whether you're indulging in all three or just uh, one. I will tell you, I don't have it in front of me, but any moment now, the inventor of Private Preserve is coming out with co something called uh, Fiserve. That is shocking. He sent me a couple of cans to try. It works. I kept a bottle of Reventos for a month. Wow. How do you close it? With a champagne stopper? Yes, with a champagne stopper. I mean, it like, the, only, yeah. the only challenge is, as you know, there's no universal champagne stopper. You know, it depends on the lip. So, you know, but it's remarkable and it's coming out soon, which is very... Yay! Um, Beautiful. What are we going to do? We're going to... Everyone's on tonight. I'm on, Madeline Trafon. Sorry, I should have introduced myself because I don't hang in Chicago nearly as much. It's been what? Uh, nine, nine months? months Ten months? Yeah, yeah since I've been there. And, uh, and I'm the conserv I'm conservative, you know, so I'm holding off on the travel business uh, for a little while. Uh, we've got JB, who runs the Chicago store. We've got um, Jeff, uh, the wine team leader. We've got Rebecca who's the spirits buyer, God lover. We had such a good time on the Glen Morangy tasting last week. I'm finally pronouncing it correctly, not Morangy, right? And of course, our beloved Joanna, who is the wine buyer uh, for Chicago. And we just figured we'd all be on and have fun together. Um, we're going to taste the three wines that we're featuring, but also um, we're going to go through a little short list of uh, options in the store because... This time of year, you know, we're trudging into, well, we're running actually into Christmas week next week. So, um, you know, holiday gift giving or holiday self-indulgence is um, the name of the game right now. Um, we're gonna take turns talking because I am tired of hearing the sound of my own voice <laughs> on virtual tastings, which is another reason in addition to missing a Chicago team more than I can say, honest to God, I can, channel that store and your company um i'm uh i'm happy to to coast on your energy tonight i have to admit so that said 
Uh, cheers again. Let me check the waiting room to make sure uh, there isn't anybody dragging. I don't think so. And we're going to go ahead and taste. So actually, the first thing we're going to do, start sipping on whatever you want to. And I'm going to uh, indulge me, talk about champagne for a minute. By the way, Jeff, Joanna, Rebecca, uh, and JB, uh, mm -hmm. please interject, especially since it's, you know, a small group of chickens tonight, correct? Uh, with anything you, you want to uh, share. I just love this hey. picture because people forget to open champagne carefully. <laughs> There's a lot of pressure in that bottle. Somebody told me once it's the equivalent of uh, the tire on a double-decker bus, right? So take away secret, over chill it, Never take the cage off, hold it, and push the cork back as you're turning the bottle, right? And hold it on a 45 degree angle. And if you're lucky, you won't lose all the bubbles that they go to a lot of trouble to put in. Here we are, it gotta show a map, right? Northern uh, most wine growing region in France. It's not hospitable. I think the average um, uh, daily temperature is 50 degrees Fahrenheit, average. You know, they deal with cold, rainy weather, so it's a bit inhospitable, uh, but it produces nice, tart base wines, which is ideal for champagne. And then here we are, here's Burgundy, by the way, and here's uh, uh, the disconnected part of, um, of uh, champagne, and that's Chablis. So we've got three main growing regions, the Montagne de Reims, where I love saying, you say Reims. How do you say Reims? Reims. Reims. Say it again. Reims. 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 <laughs> That's why it's so useful to have a Frenchman on hand, right? So, you know, they grow all the grapes everywhere. Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, and Chardonnay. But Pinot Noir reigns supreme here. Ballet de la Marne, where um, Pinot Meunier, which is trickiest to grow, uh, which is the least tricky to grow, um, dominates here. And the Cote de Blanc, uh, that's a giveaway, right, where Chardonnay dominates. Cote de Cézanne, Chardonnay also. And down here off the map, there's uh, Cote de Bar in the Aube, where, again, uh, a lot of red grapes, Pinot Noir and Meunier. Uh, so the short version on the Méthode Classique, a.k.a. Méthode Champenoise, a.k.a. Méthode Traditionnelle. So I think Méthode Classique is what they're using officially in Champagne right now. So you get a base wine that's made either in a barrel, usually neutral, or a tank. Uh, you blend it. Usually dozens of lots go into making... Um, you know, especially the larger champagne houses, uh, multi or non-vintage uh, 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 blends. You put it in the bottle, that's made wine, right? You add what? Sugar, yeast, and a little bit of a fining agent. Give it a temporary cork. And what happens? Secondary fermentation, the yeast deposits uh, in the bottle. And uh, in France, I think the minimum, I'm, I'm sure the minimum aging on the lees is 12 months with another um, up to uh, at least 15 months in the cave before they release it for sale. They got to get the yeast out. So they either use an automated gyro pallet, which I think the terrific um, French, uh, Spanish folk mm -hmm. invented. And most of the champagne houses use it now, except for... Uh, some of them use the riddling racks, which Madame Clico, you know, takes credit for, but it was probably her cellar master that um, thought it up, right? Um, where they're uh, doing hand remoulage, where they're turning the bottle, you know, small twists to get the yeast in, uh, in the neck. So then they can freeze it and get it out of the bottle and then top it off with uh, wine um that uh may or may not be sweetened right so there may be sugar sugar syrup in the wine or not depending on what they're aiming for i love this picture isn't that great look at the amount really of leaves cool. i mean it's great and you can do um what they call um uh um Degorgement, I think it's called a la volée, where it flies out, where you don't freeze it, but you lose more wine. Commonly now, they put the neck in a brine solution, um, so they lose less wine that way. There's like a plug of ice. But I just love seeing these bottles uh, lit, and you can see the sediment in the um, 
in the uh, in the neck. And actually, being a remieur, someone who was hand, you know, riddling these was uh, quite a a job in its day. Um, I wanted to show you some pictures because they're just so beautiful. Um, this is uh, the village of Epernay, and as we're looking through this, look, it is chock full of vineyards. It was a very big deal in, let me see, in 2009, after a lot of controversy, argument, blah, 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 they finally expanded the vineyards of Champagne. So now they're like 350 some villages as opposed to 319, 320. But it was very controversial because they, you know, they couldn't expand their production. Beautiful picture of um, the grapes. Madeline, yeah, what, the, what was the wine going into before Champagne? Just a uh, Cremant or? Uh, before, oh, before, that's a or, great question because obviously vineyards were grown there, right? I don't know. That's a you look it up question and let <laughs> us know. Cool. Okay. Um, you know, but they expanded the, I really don't know. It's a great question. And somebody, I just says IGT probably, perhaps. Yeah. God IGT. loves people who are studying. I didn't oh, know there was IGT in France, actually. I'm sorry. But... Uh, well, it's uh, called something else. Yeah. Um, IGP, it's called. Indication yes. Géographique okay. Protégée. Mm. Right. I'm so proud of my little accent, right? So yeah, here's uh, Ambonnet. We're in the Montagne de... How do you say it again? It's almost like an engine. You like... <laughs> no. Rance, like that. So you're in Ambonnet, which is a Grand Cru village in um, in uh, the Montagne de Reims, and you're looking at Bouzy, another Grand Cru village. So the whole issue with Grand Cru uh, is that these, you know, you have that classification, but they're rated by village, uh, not by vineyard. And um, actually, it doesn't officially figure into how much money they get anymore from uh, depending on how their vineyards are, are rated and depending on what village they're in. But um, the the comité, you know, that uh, makes, they now suggest uh, to the growers and, and to the merchants who are paying the growers for grapes, how much they should pay. Uh, and I just love this. This was uh, spring in the uh, IE in the Valais de la Marne. So, uh, chalk is He's, uh, he's also, a, I mean, a very famous city in French history, actually. Yeah. A lot of kings were sacred over there. In Champagne, Champagne. In Reims, in the oh, cathedral Reims? of Reims. Oh, right. And actually, didn't they? They started, um, um, they were, uh, a lot of coronations started taking yes. place mm -hmm. there. And yeah. they were using Champagne even before it was bubbly, right? Yep. To, uh, to toast the coronation. Yeah. So, you know, to that point, um, the bubbles didn't start appearing with any regularity after Dom Perignon's death, like we're talking, you know, early 1700s, because prior to that, he worked very hard to stop the refermentation because the, the bottles were exploding, the French um, bottles, until the English came up with um, um, a different method of making bottles. What was it? Wood versus coal-fired bottles that made stronger bottles. But this is like too cool for words. You know, you go to Champagne, you put your hand up against the wall and it's cold and damp. And then you look at your hand and it's white. I mean, this is chalk, right? It is um, chalk subsoil. That's the result of fossilized remains of, I like saying this because it's a Greek word, kephalopods, right? So uh, <laughs> very small fossilized creatures. And it's got a very high limestone contact that rumor has it is linked to increased acidity. So you've got chalk and a limestone subsoil, which is Pinot Noir and Chardonnay's idea of nirvana, right? Here's another cellar at Reims. I love it. Look at, I mean, mil, this is like miles and miles, or actually correctly, kilometers and kilometers, right, JB? Yes. Of cellars. I wanted to show you this because this is really neat it, and it really demonstrates how in the ob, where they don't have chalk, they have clay. These are ancient cellars that date back to the Cistercian monks in like the 1200s, 1300s, but they're not chalk based. They're um, different types of rock. And um, there it is. There's the egg. I wanted to show you this because the whole issue of, you know, 
what do you ferment the base wine in? People think wood, oh my God, it's gonna taste like oak. They're using neutral barrels, but some of the creative producers, in this case, Drapier, right? Not a grower, is the first to create um, a wooden egg inspired by the cement eggs that a lot of hip producers are using these days because the wine, um, when it's fermenting in an egg, it's sort of, you know, you don't have to agitate it. It rolls around by itself, which is very cool indeed. But Anything I think indeed yeah. going to Champagne, like even for a trip, you know, a wine trip, I think mm -hmm. a lot of people think about Bordeaux or Burgundy mm -hmm. and Champagne actually is fantastic because you have these big Champagne houses who have been there for a long time. They have those cellars that you just showed, uh, you know, those chalk cellars and they have, uh, uh, there's really a lot to see in those areas and the restaurants around are phenomenal and, you know, very well priced. So it's great. Oh, are they, they're moderately priced, really? I think so, compared to maybe Bordeaux and Paris, yes. It's a good place to visit. By the way, anybody, um, you know, our official guests, our team members, if you want to speak up, just unmute yourself. It's just us, you know, <laughs> so this is as intimate as it gets. Thank you for letting me trump through a little bit of information, but I always think it's nice to, uh, um, you know, get a background. Anybody else want to share something before we uh, go ahead and taste the jacquard? The word champagne is related somehow to, like, a plane, right? I mean, my understanding has been that there's no trees because of the chalk soils, and that's why it's named Champagne. And Let's similar. Go. JB, can you address that? Let's see. No trees here. No trees. Yeah, a few trees. It's highly possible. I'm not sure why the, the name came from. That's a very good question. Uh, I would have to look it up. But in this, is that soil is difficult for anything to grow? It definitely. Right. But the same, I think, for the cognac region, which has a champagne, but also have limestone base. Yep. So we've got two lookups. We've got the what were they doing with the grapes before they expanded in 2009? And we've got the origin of um, the origin of the word champagne. So you guys are going to describe this. How is it tasting? Because I've been talking for a while. You've all got it in your glass. JB, how's the Chicard tasting? What's the style? Um, so, and I, I mean, I, I'm okay to start. I thought maybe someone else was going to do it. Oh, that's right. No, go ahead. I mean, you know, go ahead. <laughs> Jackson. <laughs> um, I'm going to let Joanna off the hook. She gets to say a lot later, but go for it. Well, to me, the, the champagne, the jacquard is, uh, you know, on the nose, you get a little bit of, of lees, but also a little bit of fruit, I would say. Um, and then on the palate, the, the way I always think of Jacquard is um, it's quite broad in a way. It's, it really fills the mouth entirely. Mm. Um, it's got it's a little ample and it, make, it kind of rolls. It's got some mellowness to it. And on the, on the beginning, at the, uh, the start of uh, the beginning, of the, when you taste it, so the acidity is not harsh or, or, or no. compelling. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. Uh, and I get a you know a nice notion of fruit, like a grape, uh, as if you were biting in a grape in a way. And then I think afterwards, I get a little bit more of that chalky minerality that comes a little afterwards. But is, that is not aggressive. Is it delicious? It, it's delicious. I think it's it's always been you know for us. I think one of our best seller. And at that price point, it's very hard to beat. Uh, what are you guys charging for it? Thirty dollars. Oh, you can't beat it. I mean, truly, I get like I giggle thinking of that because most French champagne these days we have to buy it for thirty plus. How's it tasting to you, Jeff? Is it? It's. I mean, for me, what I like about it is it's really fresh and fruity and approachable. Um, but I'm looking at the the notes, and up to thirty five percent of it's reserved. So it is packing a lot of roundness from that, I think. Thank you for looking that up. I really appreciate it because that's one of the things that uh, distinguishes this as a champagne house. By the way, this is their emblem, which, you know, it's Pegasus and fame, fame mounted on Pegasus, which I think is just 
too cool. This is a very new house. It was founded in the 1960s wow. by um, some growers. And I'm not entirely sure if they're a public company now. They don't talk about their ownership, but they have up to 1,600 growers they're sourcing from, um, which is amazing. And to Jeff's point, they're known for a couple of things, up, up to 35% of reserve wines, which means what? Not the current vintage. Mm -hmm. And extended lease contact, depending on what, you know, what, uh, even for their multi-vintage or non-vintage fruit, three to five years. Um, and their dosage is not low. It's nine grams per liter. And the folks who don't know what that, what we're talking about there, when we talk about dryness level, um, a regular brute can have up to 12 grams per liter um, sugar which makes it not sweet, but mellow and a little fruitier. Uh, an extra brut up to six grams per liter. And if they call it a brut nature or a brut non dosé, it's up to three grams per liter, which is sort of, you know, the hip uh, category these days. But Jacquard is doing traditional dosage, so they're not going after that. Um, this is, <laughs> as they started in the 1960s, they didn't have, you know, a beautiful... Um, showcase of, uh, of a base. And this is, uh, they purchased in 2009, this hotel, Hotel de Brimont, which is in Reims. And I'm sorry, I'm not never going to pronounce it correctly, but it's pretty glorious, isn't it? So obviously they must have been doing well. Um, they hired this uh, young woman, Florian Esnac, who I have to read this to you because it's very cool. No one in my family is involved in the wine industry, but I think I've always been interested in roles traditionally dominated by men. My childhood dream was to become a fighter pilot for the French Air Force. But my father, as a wine lover, taught me how to taste by playing games. So she um, has been the uh, winemaker since uh, 2011. So going on um, 10 years. Um, yeah. pretty neat story don't you think they're also they're committed um, I don't know if they insist their growers do this or they nudge them in that direction but they're proud of the fact that most of their growers use no insecticides um, then they uh, are promoting biodiversity through the use of hedges you know ground cover flowers and they only use organic uh, amendments meaning you know copper sulfate and the like. Cool, huh? <laughs> Anyone else want to talk about how it tastes? Do Joanna and Rebecca, do you have it in front of you? It's nicely balanced. It's, nothing is exaggerated here, uh, but it's got that nice mouth-watering finish mm -hmm. that stays with you in a nice way. Um, it's got a little bit of that toasty yeastiness, but not too much. Mm -hmm. And usual suspects of citrus, apple, and pear are present, so it's got what it needs. But it must have some depth with uh, that, uh, all those reserve wines and the yeah. extended leaves. Cool. Yeah, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's kind of a push and pull between like the fruit and the, mm -hmm. the rounded reservedness for me. It has length? It's got aftertaste? Yeah, for sure. Cool. Um, anybody I, asking cool questions? As well. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca's saying the almond note on the Shakar. Actually, you know, that whole, I think the almond note um, is part of the whole um, autolytic character that, you know, thing that's impossible to express. That's the um, relationship between the wine and the leaves over a long period of time. And a lot of time it comes off, you know, brioche or, you know, like croissant or, you know, baked stuff, but also nuts. Absolutely for sure. I don't know if uh, our guests have it and if they like it, but by all means, interrupt us if you want. Yes, yeah, so or, or you can, uh, you know, guests can also speak in the chat if you have any questions. Yeah. Feel free to, uh, Especially if you're shy little... about asking your questions that you might think are silly questions and are never silly questions, <laughs> right? Because, you know, I, I actually am very proud of the fact that I often ask the silliest question because I know some of my colleagues want to ask it and they won't. 
So if we're uh, in front of a bunch of, uh, you know, if we're in a situation where we're supposed to know what we're talking about, I'll usually ask the winemaker the silly question. Um, before I talk about La Ronde Perrier, um, one of you want to take the, the ball and describe how it's behaving in the glass as opposed to or in contrast to uh, the Jacquard? That might be fun. I mean, for me, it's not as much fruit. Um, it's a little more brioche and like a floral honeysuckle uh, mixed with like a lemon curd. Oh, neat. So it's got that, and then on the palate, the acidity is a little more raised, I'd say, than the Chicard, and it's got, like, it's got a little bit of a roundness, but also, like, a white peachy kind of character to it. Is it coming off drier, more mouth, more palate cleansing? It's sleeker. It's, it's Yeah, ooh. just the acidity itself, it's I think. more focused. Mm -hmm. I really like their style. Well, and you know, and, except and they, for the rosé, they're all Chardonnay based. Yeah, the Chardonnay based, absolutely. Uh, even this one is uh, over fifty percent mm -hmm. uh, Chardonnay, which is really cool. And they really pride themselves on that lifted Chardonnay based style, right? Yeah. So I think yeah. they walk they walk the line with the acidity and mm -hmm. you know the reserve that's really focused and tight. And and finer bubbles also. I, I yes. Would. And I would say probably because they, they pride themselves on actually, if they didn't actually invent it, they're one of the first that pioneered the non-dosage category for- I think um, they, not the, did. they were the first. Were they the believe. first? Right. So they, you know, they're very, um, uh, they're very careful and sparing about their dosage. But, well, they also uh, pioneered uh, rosé champagne. Rose. When they came out with their rosé, <clears throat> excuse me, which was in 1968. Nobody was making rosé I didn't know that. They were the first? Yeah, and the shape of the bottle is also mm -hmm. something that they kind of originated, I think. Their rosé to me is one of the, the benchmarking as far as I'm concerned. The, the, Ro the Ron Perrier rosé is one of the best. Uh, I don't think I've ever tasted it. My bad. It's, yeah, oh it's my so goodness. Pale and delicate and very lovely and pretty. Oh, that's right, because it's a, a lighter a lighter color, correct? Well, it's all direct press, too. They don't, a lot of rosé champagnes, they'll add some still Pinot Noir in to give it the mm -hmm. pinkness and the flavor profile. But La Ronde Perrier, I think, is one of the few people who do direct press rosé. That is killer. So, I didn't know that. Very Yeah, pink. that's right. Can you define yeah. direct press for us? Just, you know, um, so they're not adding red wine, right? Mm -mm. And it's 100% Pinot Noir. Right. Well, and it's also, it's more uncertain, too, because when you're doing the direct press, when you have the rosé champagne and it's aging on the leaves, the color can really change. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a risky thing, but I think they've probably gotten down to a science because they've been doing it so long and doing it really well for so long. Well, you know what? I bet the people who are using the addition of red wine, which is most of them, including on their very expensive stuff, Mm -hmm. uh, like Dom Perignon Rosé have, you know, talked us all into thinking that, that there's no difference. But uh, you have to give a little bit of a hat tip to the people who A, pioneered the category and B, are doing it the challenging way, right? Um, these big folks, must like, most like Jakar, uh, much like Jakar, didn't have, you know, a cool building. And they picked theirs up in 1989, Chateau de Louvois, which is... Um, in, uh, what is it, Tour de Marne. Uh, this is killer picture, and I have to tell you why. This woman, uh, Marie-Louise uh, de Nonancourt, is the mother of this guy, Bernard de Nonancourt. And she actually purchased this during, um, where did she get it? I have, oh, here we go. She bought it in 1939. We're talking World War II, right? Her, yep. She came from a long list, a line of champagne makers, but she bought it to provide um, a future in the industry for her sons, Maurice and Bernard. Um, and both of them fought the Germans uh, in the French resistance. And tragically, Maurice was captured and died uh, in a concentration camp. But Bernard uh, made it through the war. He, his unit was the first to arrive at Hitler's eagle's nest. And... Um, they discovered a stash of over half a million bottles of wine. <laughs> he 
including first growth Bordeaux, vin and champagne, cognac, etc. But when, you know, after the war, when he took over from his mother, I mean, imagine her guts, her grit to do this. He was not even 30 years old when he took over. Um, so it's really impressive considering they are a big company. They are the largest family owned group left in Champagne. They produce 10 million plus bottles and they um, are the third largest landowners in Champagne. But I just love looking at the picture of this woman and talking about her. Um, and today, you know, Bernard really put the modern uh, Laurent Perrier on the map without going into a lot of details, his daughters now, Stephanie and Alexandra, uh, you know, both of them married. So maybe in France, yes. your maiden name, well, that's right, Menaud, no, you put your maiden name, which is not encore, before your married name, is that common? No, I mean, I think things change recently. Mm -hmm. I mean, before it was, you were, you had just the husband's name. Um, mm -hmm. Now it's changed, and maybe because the non encore is a famous name, they wanted. I, I'm not sure. Yet. Oh, you might be right about that because it's a famous yeah. name, name in in Champagne, right? Um, but, you know, they he died. Uh, Bernard died in 2010. But to quote, I actually met this woman. I met Alexandra because I was um, moderating a panel at the Women in Wine Leadership Symposium in New York, and she was on it. And uh, what an elegant beautiful, intelligent woman. And she said that the two of them were only too aware of their father's strong desire for them to take over the helm, but it was very tricky after he died. You know, there were over 750 growers uh, that they had to negotiate with. Um, you know, they had the financial dealings of a large champagne house, which is very tricky, uh, but they managed it. And, uh, you know, to make a long story short, they are indeed running the company, which is publicly traded, but they have a uh, controlling interest. And the two wines that they think are their thumbprints are their best wines are the Ultra Brut and the Grand Siècle. And Joanna, you were talking about Grand Siècle, their um, Tête de Cuvée earlier. What is unique about it? Well, it's uh, most Tête de Cuvées are vintage dated. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be, they say it's the only one that isn't. Um, if you think about, you know, Dom Perignon and Claude de Menil and uh, Tattinger, Comte de Champagne and all this. And it's always a blend of three vintages. And they, uh, the youngest of which is the base wine, but it's not, no more or less than three. And... Um, they that's how they blend it so they're very unique in that respect yeah that's you know, another very... thing they do that you know, another kind of pioneering innovative thing that they do i think it's really cool that we're celebrating and talking about a large champagne house that is passionately quality driven because much like burgundy you know if i can bring this up you know small is not better small is small and big is big but when you talk about like joseph drouin when you have Dominique Drew and Boss, who's handling the winemaking on two continents and does a pretty rocking job, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. In Oregon and in Burgundy, and they're amazingly dependable qualitatively. You've got another very, very large champagne house that's family owned and operated and doing when a great you, job. When you think about the cost of land in those two places, uh, mm -hmm. if you're a little guy, you're gonna stay little. How are you gonna mm -hmm. expand? Um, Rotorer is another one that uh, owns a lot of land. They're farming all of it biodynamically. And uh, last I checked, and it was a long time ago, 70% of their fruit was supplied from their own vineyards. And in a large house, that's very- That's unreal. a staggering amount, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I am nudging us to start talking about this list and Joanna's going to take the ball on this, but you know, if anyone wants to chime in, please do. And we're just spending, you know, a sec on each talking about what makes them special. And those of you who are our guests, I emailed this to you. Uh, we'll have it in the, the store as well, but we're basically highlighting some wines that we have plenty of that would make terrific gifts or personal indulgence. And speaking of indulgence, Joanna, we're starting out with the, uh, you know, the exciting pricey category of Tete de Cuvée. So go for it. 
Yeah, well, we just kind of went over the Grand Siècle and what's so special about that, but I will add that this gift pack is gorgeous and mm -hmm. it, it's a box that opens up and there are two beautiful glasses with etched uh, images of the Sun King on there and it, it's beautiful. Um, the bottle is beautiful too. Yeah, it's it's gorgeous and, and it, it, again, it's their house style of truly elegant fineness that uh, that really kind of defines that. Uh, and uh, that could be Limone, who is um, in the Cote de Blanc, and everything they make is 100% Chardonnay, Grand Cru Chardonnay. Um, this particular one is from a particular village, and it is a special club wine. And the special club is a consortium of 28 grower producers little guys who uh, figured that they could band together and create an image that as we were discussing, they're, they're small, they can't market it like La Grande Dame or Dom Perignon or something. So what they did was they established certain standards for these wines and it has to be vintage dated and only And sorry, it has to be vintage dated, right? And the best wine that they make, correct? Did we lose Joanna? Uh-oh. Let me see. Yeah, and the other thing to note is that it's a 2012, which is impressive for, uh, for a pretty extremely low price of 130, so. No, it is, I mean. For like one of the older made, wine, uh, right. yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, the whole, this is really, they define the grower, the, the concept of a grower, which mm -hmm. is a relatively new phenomena uh, in the United States, I would say over the last 20 years and probably pioneered by Kermit Lynch with uh, LaSalle, but you know, where you're talking the opposite concept of a large house, um, you know, and you're talking very uh, terroir specific. Joanna, did we lose you? Are you there? You're showing uh still participating there you are oh but you're oh, muted that's muted. what's okay. going on you're sorry muted. sorry um so go ahead and talk about the other ones yeah uh oh no I w i'm going to talk about charles heitzig right yes Real quick although i would add just want to mm -hmm. say that charles mm -hmm. heitzig founded his house although he inherited a mm -hmm. champagne uh empire but he started his own thing when he was 29 go ahead Yep. No, absolutely. He did. And he actually opened up the American market. That's, you know, the way Madame uh, Nicole um, Ponsardin Clico opened up uh, the Russian czarist Russia. Mm -hmm. We can thank uh, Champagne Charlie, which is what the American press dubbed him when he came to the States in 1852 and took it by storm. And he wrote a letter to his wife. <laughs> saying there's a rumor about me and excitement that we will greatly benefit from. So he definitely punched up his uh, exuberant character. But much like um, Jakar, actually, their claim to fame is, uh, you know, large proportion of reserve wines, you know, around 40% um, with them uh, averaging 10 years old. Um, normal dosage. Uh, I don't I haven't tasted their um, Milanera, and they're not known for Blanc de Blanc, but this is cool. And Decanter, who is that Decanter? Are they using, yes, yeah. um, you know, 97 points from these folks that don't give it away is cool. Um, what about On, Charles Heidzig? Yeah. I tried a while ago when I was still in France. They had that Cuvée Charlie 1990 or 1995, mm -hmm. 1990, I believe. Um, and I tried, I was able to get a small allocation at that time because I had a friend working for the company there. And uh, later on, I tried it. And that's, that was absolutely beautiful. That's when I realized how old champagne is phenomenal. It's, what was the style? Can you describe it? Well, at that time, it was kind of new for me. I was younger. I didn't, mm -hmm. didn't have the, the same palette probably. Mm -hmm. But it was, I remember it being a little bit more oxidative. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not sure the exact word, but uh you know more like uh oxidative notes and very a lot of toasted uh very very fine bubbles almost mm -hmm. wine and that's when i also realized uh champagne at first is uh, still wine and then it becomes uh if you have a good base wine 
you can make really great champagne if you and if you don't that's not the case um, so that's when I realized this was almost close to have no bubbles very fine delicate very long uh, on the palette it was absolutely you know two things occur to me while you're talking because the British who you know my colleagues think it's just starting to be ready to drink when I think it's starting to die, right? They like older champagnes. But what happens is it actually loses its bubbles before it actually oxidizes. So you can have a very refined um, champagne that has lost its effervescence and is terrific complex wine. Um, Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit about the Cristal 100 points by the wine enthusiast? Wow, I'm not point driven, but since I've started playing with my retail friends, I pay attention to them. and. <laughs> People don't give away a hundred points. Yeah, and well, oh my god, unless they're never mind. Um, <laughs> We're not I, naming names. Order, so and, mm -hmm. and I think you might have picked up on that from what I've already said. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is an estate bottled wine. It's biodynamic, and biodynamic farming and organic farming in Champagne is not very easy to do. It's as we've pointed out, it's it's north, it's cold, it's damp. And the place where they where everybody is biodynamic, like down in the Roussillon, where it's hot and dry and windy, but that's not what they're dealing with here. And so you have to put in a lot of effort and um, care to bring that off and, and commitment. So I definitely tip my hat to them on that. And um, the Cristal thing is that they originated it to send to Tsar Nicholas II, who liked it to be in clear glass, and it was in a lead crystal bottle with a flat bottom. Wow. And it still comes in clear glass, but it's wrapped up in a, a light uh, locking uh, cellophane thing. And uh, you don't want to put it, you know, on the shelf unwrapped, even when you put it on the shelf anyway. But uh, that's, that's how that came to be. Um, but definitely a penultimate gift, you know. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing wine and it, uh, it ages very well. Uh, I bought all the 08 I could get, and now everybody's talking about 2012, but if you're going to sit down and drink it the night that you bought it, like almost everybody does, <laughs> get the 08. It's a great vintage. Can you quickly go through the Blonde de Blonde, Blonde de Noir uh, yeah. categories for uh, us? The opposite of most of what we've been talking about is Francoise Bidel, who does not have a long history um, in Champagne, and she is also biodynamic, but the reason for that, I just found this out and it's really interesting. Her son, um, Vincent, who is now the winemaker, was really, really ill. And she took him around to all these doctors and nobody could cure him. And he finally got well after being treated with some homeopathic something or other. And so after that, she said, I'm, I'm doing that with my vines. Oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a, it was in thanks to the gods or God yes. uh, for, for curing her son uh, that she started uh, biodynamic viticulture. Very cool. So this is another grower champagne. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Very small grower. In fact, I had not heard of her, but... Uh, she was in a, a deal that I got from when uh, their importer switched distributors. And uh, Ryan, who's not with us at the moment, but he knew the wine and he was really excited when he saw that we had it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> it is mostly Meunier. It's a Blanc de Noir of Meunier. I read, it's either 90 something percent or 100 percent Meunier, which is also quite unusual. It is, but you know, they share that uh, dominance of Meunier with LaSalle, so it's nice to yeah. hear. Yeah. Cool. Pierre Peters, uh, on the other hand, uh, is, is we're back in the Cote de Blanc, and everything he makes is 100% Chardonnay, um, except I, he does have a rosé, which we didn't, we ordered a, on a pre sale and it never showed up, so it's quite rare. <laughs> but in the meantime, his, uh, 
non-vintage cuvee de reserve. It's called that because he puts a lot of reserve wine in it. It's all from Grand Cru uh, vineyards. And I think for 60 bucks, it's a, a, it's a steal. And this was the first grower champagne that I met, I don't know how many years ago, and I was still on premise in restaurants, like so well over 10 years ago. But I just fell in love with Pierre Peters because it introduced me to the category. Now, what distinguishes this Charton Taillet is another grower champagne. This whole category is grower champagne, right? Well, but Charton Taillet isn't, isn't an all Chardonnay house mm -hmm. by any means. In fact, this stuff is 100% Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. And they're in a village called Murphy, which is uh, seven kilometers north of Grants. <laughs> Only JB there. can do it right. <laughs> But I, if I'm not mistaken, I think that their Cuvée Saint Anne and most of their wines are, are more Pinot centric. Cool. I think we should go ahead and start tasting the uh, next wine. Uh, oh, good, good problem. Rebecca's really struggling with uh, the Tete Cuvée from Heidsick or Cristal. Yeah, she's got to say yeah. something about Heidsick. So I have to say, before we go on, you know what my favorite Tete Cuvée is? And it's not even their Tete Cuvée, but they put a lot of attention to it. Uh, I'm going to sound like a reserve, reverse snob. I love Cru Grand Yes! Oh, yeah. God, you said it. Cru Grand Cuvée. And do you know why I love it so much? Because if you can give it to a complete nerd snob, and they will grudgingly like it. And you can get Aunt Minnie, who's never had champagne, and she will like it. It manages to be deep, exotic, you know, complex, delicious, all at the same time for around $200. <laughs> you know, but yeah. Well, they say that it's their hardest wine to make, which is surely true yes. because it's a blend. It's a blend. Uh, now, so here we are. Okay. La Salle. I'm going to give you the short version of La Salle, which is, this is to me, one of the coolest uh, uh, champagnes to talk about. By the way, right before everyone else got on, we were, as the trade, gossiping. We were complaining that champagne websites are horrific. They're awful. They never give you deep information. They're all blah, blah, you know. And they cut off where you're trying to scroll. And they, They're they awful. give you all They're this awful. flowery bullshit. Yeah. But the flowery <laughs> BS, yes. However, LaSalle is part of the Kermit Lynch portfolio, who, by the way, pioneered grower champagne mm -hmm. imported into the United States. And when asked, I, I read just yesterday an interview with the winemaker, one of the three women who are associated with this label. This is a woman's tasting tonight for some strange reason. It just turned out that way. But uh, Angeline Templier, who's the winemaker for La Salle, um, uh, said that, uh, why did Kermit Lynch pick up La Salle and bring it into the US? Um, and her response was because he had a crush on the wines. And that's the story of Kermit Lynch. He always recognized quality and um, then uh, proceeded to develop a relationship with the grower, which would last for decades because his people don't leave him. This is be beautiful, beautiful shot of Chigny La Rose, which, correct me if I'm wrong, is in the Vallée de la Marne, but adjacent to the Montagne de Reims. So they're, you know, they're right there between the two. And I just love this shot. These are the three women, three generations. This is so thrilling to look at this. Olga. Oh, wow. Yes. Is uh, uh, the grandmother who took over after her father, or her uh, husband died. Uh, Angeline. Well, actually, Chantal is her daughter. And Angeline Templier is her granddaughter. And I'm embarrassed to say I should have looked it up because she's pushing her over 90. I don't know if she's still with us, but... Um, their actual, they have a tradition called une femme, un esprit, un style. One woman, one spirit, one style. Isn't that cool? But they, you know, as much as they are three women who took over um, after Jules uh, established the family-owned house in the 1940s. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Chigny Le Rose is in the Montagne de Rennes, but they are dominantly a Pinot Meunier house. Um, so here they are in the cellar. Another beautiful picture, isn't it? 
Yeah. But um, uh, we're talking about a unique grower champagne. They do something that very few other uh, uh, champagne producers do, which is uh, they complete their base wines, go through malolactic fermentation. Uh, which, you know, they are looking to reduce the acidity in their champagne, which is, you know, somewhat, I don't know if it's controversial, but it's certainly not done by a lot of them. Um, they're, they still hand riddle. They're not using a gyro pellet. Um, and they were one of the first to uh, claim the disgorgement date on uh, their bottles. And their wines age for this wine that we're tasting, that, or you're tasting, the Brut Rosé, almost four years on the lease on the lease so this is interesting because you you can start paying attention to um when they say aging in the cellar how much of that is you know entourage with the lease and how much of it is after disgorgement right how is it tasting you guys rebecca you've been quiet do you have it in front of you I do um yeah i there's I never believed in rosé champagne when I was first starting out in wine. Um, for me, the, the best quality of champagne was the toasty wheeziness. That's what I really liked. And I thought a rosé champagne was sort of a waste because you didn't really get the toasty wheeziness to the same degree. Um, and, you know, if I wanted a fruit, red fruit forward sparkling, I could go somewhere cheaper, right? So I, it took me a long time to come around a rosé champagne and I think the best ones really balance that fruitiness and that toastiness. And I think I get it in the salle. If I was, if I had my eyes closed, I don't know if I would off the bat say that it was a rosé, right? Oh, because very cool. So it's, um, the structure it doesn't define um, the fact that it's a rosé. Right, but then it has some really, I think, nice, elegant, like, white cherry and, like, maybe a touch of raspberry, you know, so it, that rosé quality is still coming through, but it's, well, you know, balanced into the rest of the champagne, this, this of the champagne. That well, I think you're, you're doing a poetic job describing it. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, I would say that, like, the, the underlying like fruitiness is like a subtle strawberry raspberry that just kind of like pervades underneath and kind of creeps in on you. I don't know if any of our guests have it. If they, our guests have been very, very quiet and paying attention to us nicely, but that's okay. We don't like to force anyone to participate. Uh, but Alan is saying, um, oh, drinking only for about, uh, he actually has it. It's also relatively new to you. And I'm glad uh, you're enjoying it. Thank you for the comment. Um, I'm still just drinking my Charles Heitzig. So I'm a little jealous that you have the La Salle because I've never had that rosé. But I will make the comment that I think their preference they're, you know, non-vintage brut. They're, um, they're uh, champagne normale, as the Italians would say, is just glorious. It's one of my favorite, um, you know, non-vintage, multi-vintage champagnes. Do you guys have it in the store? The preference, is it gettable? Which? The De La Salle, yeah. Yeah, it's on the shelf. Cool, we have a hard bucks. time getting it. Come and get one. it. What do you charge for it? 65 you know, it, it's a lot of wine for the money. Um, it's very good. So we have to quickly share uh, the rest of the wines on the little wine list that we've got going. So you're going to talk about the rosé and then the half bottles that are your favorite category. Go for it, Joanna. Well, we kind of covered the Laurent Perrier rosé yep. mm -hmm. also. Uh, I'll just reiterate <clears throat> that it's 100% um, Pinot Noir and there's no... Most rosé is made pink by the addition of still wine. Uh, they don't have any in here. The, the pinkness is from skin contact and that's it. So that's a little bit unusual. Um, but again, it, it reflects their elegant uh, style that I like so much. The Via Cart, um, I made some notes on it, which I can't read because it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that's okay tell Very us what you remember as well. well it's about half chardonnay mm -hmm. and it has uh 
here's it, 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 the still Pinot Noir that goes into it is not picked early for high acidity like most of this stuff is. It's it's ripe. It's it's red wine that they put in there, and it's eight percent, which is less than say the Moet and a lot of other ones, I think. And so, but it probably uh, adds something that you don't usually find uh, because there's usually not a lot of ripe grapes involved in champagne. So I think that's interesting. And I think they're the ones who said, it's not a rosé champagne, it's a champagne rosé. In other words, just like what you were saying, if I closed my eyes and I didn't know this was a rosé, I wouldn't know it was a rosé. And that's what they want you to, how they want you to feel about this wine. It also has kind of a cult following. Um, I'm surprised that it's so readily available here because on the West Coast, it's, uh, people just snatch it up. Moet, uh, well, they're the biggest, uh, but they still make some darn good wine. And um, this one is kind of surprisingly another extra brut, which you might expect from that house that it would not be. And it's in pretty small letters on the, on the packaging, but it is there and it's vintage dated and um, it's, it's good. Uh, Chique, I don't know a lot about Chique, but there's eight generations of them and they use all three grapes. And uh, headed back to the Cote de Blanc, Pierre Monqui, he actually does grow a little bit of red wine there, but not very much, red grapes. Um, this is a half bottle of Grand Cru Blanc de Blanc Brut, which is uh, a steal. I mean, yeah. come on. It's, <laughs> it's one of my favorite things that we've tried this year, to be honest. And uh, it, it is all uh, stainless and it all goes through malolactic in stainless, which is kind of unusual too. And which certainly suggests that what they're starting out with is very acidic. Oh, um. But it has, a, it has some richness, it has a creaminess to its texture that mm -hmm. again, you might not expect from that wine. It's, it's very good. I think we're doing a sensational job. We haven't even hit uh, past, uh, well, by my, my time, 8.30, uh, 7.30 your time. But a couple, a couple three things um, are next tasting. And then we're going to talk about a little bit about food and wine harmony and champagne. But I don't want to forget to tell everyone that um, we're going to collaborate with Michigan. And on um, January, I think it's the 21st, which yeah. is our... Um, the third Thursday in January, we're going to take a little break. We're going to do the opposite of tonight. We're going to do <laughs> the best Chris, uh, post-Christmas deals around or under 15 bucks uh, with an additional little list. Because I think this is cool, isn't it? That we do this backup list of things that are in the stores. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, I want us all to talk about just one dish that you adore with champagne. Because to me... The whole issue is, first of all, it takes care of everything weird. You know, every sommelier worth their salt on the planet when they're, hit, they're looking at a dish where the chef totally ignores anything about food and wine harmony and is throwing vinegar at it and heat and sweetness and weird flavors. When in doubt, you know, bring up champagne. But it does a phenomenal job with high acidity in food, with fat in food, and with heat in food, right? And exotic flavors. So, do you mind if we go around and talk about our favorite foods with champagne? And that includes oysters. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, Absolutely. Mine is a food that is, although not expensive, it's um, for me an extreme indulgence, and that is fried chicken. Oh, great <laughs> idea! Yes. And oh boy, is champagne great with fried chicken. Uh, a couple of years ago, Anthony gave us all half bottles of Krug mm -hmm. because he wanted us to oh. know what it was. Oh my God. <laughs> Anthony, by the way, just to remind all, us all, Anthony, we said, I, I, I'm telling you, take this home or take this out and have it with a meal and dip it. 
So uh, that's what I had it with. I never post on Instagram, but I posted <laughs> my half bottle of crew with a plate of fried chicken. I want to remind us all, Anthony Minnie used to be um, the wine team leader. At oh, Plum. yes. He opened the store and is still a dear friend and now sells wine to us happily from, fortunately, a great distributor. So Absolutely, that, so, yes. Well, well, right. while, while I have you, can I just, I, there's one, two other things I want to say before we leave the champagne topic. And one is right back in the beginning, Madeline, when you were talking about how many wines go into the blend for the base wine, it is absolutely mind boggling. I, you've probably done this, but I actually sat down with a uh, cellar master when Frederick Paneotis was the cellar master at uh, Vov. He, God bless him, took me through a component tasting of all these wines. And I was like, how on earth do you intuit what's going to happen even to any one of these individually, much less when you blend 30? Joanna, I've never wow. done that. So yeah, I'm actively amazing. jealous. And my conclusion is it's voodoo. I mean, they're mm. tasting Van Clare. They're tasting the incredibly it's high acid high acid, base. low alcohol. You would never want to drink it. They've got a combination of the angels talking to them and, <laughs> you know, ESP. I don't know how they figure it yeah, out. Yeah, it's know. absolutely amazing. And the other thing I just want to point out is that uh, half bottles are great. Uh, we have more than what's listed here. We have six or seven half bottles of champagne and not enough half bottles of other stuff. But uh, nowadays, especially when we are off and uh, indulging ourselves. <laughs> uh, it's a very good thing. Bravo. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, fantastic <laughs> food and wine harmony. None of us are going to be able to beat it, but go ahead. Would one of you want to take that ball? Well, I, I'll jump in and it's, I'm glad that you brought up how uh, champagne goes with everything. Cause that's, I wanted to also bring that up because I think that's really one of the strengths of champagne. It, it does go with everything. And on the topic of rosé, I think that's what I like also. And I saw in the chat, we mentioned that I think rosé uh, champagne is great with a meal. I think there's that structure uh, that's brought up by the, the red wine as well that really uh, help it, you know, pair with a lot of food. And as far as my pairing, me... Um, there's a, a pairing I do often that I really enjoy. It's a, a little bit of an indulgence. I do it usually for, you know, holidays. And uh, it would be like scallops with, uh, mm. say, sep. I'm not sure how you guys, is it sep in English also? It's that mushroom. Yes. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Sep mushroom sauce. So it's like a creme fraiche sauce mm -hmm. room on scallops. Oh, yeah. So you have sweetness, but you have earthiness too. Yes. And yeah. you have butter. Yay. So, yeah, with a tête de cuvée, for example, that's fantastic. Jeff or Rebecca, how about you guys? Well, mine is uh, similar to JB's in that uh, the things that you can put in are whatever you like, but I like uh, risotto. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, when you make it, it's kind of a big deal because it takes so much effort. So you throw, you know, some sort of seafood, some mushroom, something green, and champagne just ties it all together, so... Ooh, and Irene yeah. uh, is, is reminding us that we can get uh, porcinis at Plum. Yay. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and, you know, career vegetarian here, the beautiful thing about mushrooms is that if you're making a vegetarian dish for a guest, even against your better judgment, they're a bridge to red wine and mm -hmm. all kinds of wine because of that earthiness. Umami. <laughs> umami, yes. Umami, right. What do you like with champagne, Rebecca? Well, you know, fried chicken, um, but not like fancy fried chicken, you know, like I haven't tried it yet, but I imagine the Popeye's fried chicken sandwich <laughs> with, you know. Krug, right? <laughs> Krug, definitely. Okay. Um, but, you know, to JB and, and Jeff's point, sometimes I'll just make something at home and it's something that maybe has a lot of ingredients or, you know, has a, a, some fattiness or it has its own acidity and champagne is such a versatile choice. Well, you true. bring up something great because yeah. if the food has a lot of acidity, champagne does one of two things exceptionally well. It loves acid in food and it just actually makes the champagne taste softer. 
but it also slices through fat like a house on fire, right? So mm -hmm. when in doubt, there you go, right? Yeah. And I think a lot of people try to do um, campaign with sweet things or with chocolate. And, you know, I think none of the ones that we've talked about, but if we had like a demi-sec champagne, you know, like a lemon tart or something or a dessert that had acidity, but not a lot of sweetness, but with a champagne that has some sweetness, I think that can work. And I, and I enjoy, you know, like citrus desserts with champagne as well. Oh, citrus desserts that are not too sweet, right? right? Like a tart, a lemon, a tart lemon tart, for instance, with yes. a demi champagne. Yeah. I love this. Alan just suggested uh, a, a champagne slushy by putting it in the freezer, but I will say, make sure you pour a glass out before you put it in the freezer. Yes. Right? Um, I will tell you my favorite food with champagne, crunchy, salty, fatty. I, le I learned this at the heels, at the feet of um, my ex-boss, Jimmy Schmidt, a great chef, one of the first- uh, Oh um, yeah, the uh, rattle Celebrated oh. by James Beard Award, right? And I worked for him. He worked at the original London Chop House and then uh, took off uh, and handed me the wine list. I said, thank you, Jimmy. Came back and I worked for him at the Rattlesnake Club, but he used to make the killer Cracker Crest pizza. So basically, Cracker Crest pizza, no tomato sauce, the cheese of your choice, you know, rock salt, um, whatever herbs you love, rosemary and olive oil, right? It's murderous combination. Um, you know, so you can just go back and it, it, it follows the lines of popcorn, only it's a lot better, right? And I, my personal favorite cheese is Gruyere uh, for something like that. I just love, um, I love Gruyere and Cracker Crust pizza. But, you know, we are not talking Asian, you know, it's killer with sushi. As long as the Asian dishes are not overtly sweet, uh, in which case, hey, bring out the demi sec, you know, right? Yeah. Uh, and Alan has learned how to saber. I can't do it. I did it once. And you remember, Irene, you remember Jimmy. I have to tell you, Jimmy Schmidt's daughter, Taylor Schmidt, who I saw in her mother's arms when I worked at the Rattlesnake Club, uh, is now an, an amazing, talented, young sommelier. Uh, and, you know, it is just so touching for me to, to see that continuity um, in our culture, especially at a time when restaurants are struggling so much. Yep, go Taylor Schmidt. Absolutely. She's so special. Um, so that said, uh, you know, um, we had a wonderful time tonight. I hope you, you folks did too, who you were joining us. We're going to make this available um, the, uh, to others as well, along with our little PDF wine list. And uh, I want the old time, uh, old town team to know how much I love you and appreciate you. And I miss we you. We miss you. Uh, and, yeah, you're uh, the best, Madeline. <laughs> so we have to think of more cool things to do until we all, you know, can travel uh, with exuberance. And um, I hope that we all keep safe and that we find joy in whatever situation presents uh, itself to us. You know, whether we have to be on Zoom with our family or talk to them on the phone, but here we are enjoying each other's company, you know. Cheers to you. Please. Thank you. Safe. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Happy, Happy holidays, holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. Yeah. Thank you. Take good care. And I'll see you. Uh, I'll see you at, treat, at least on Zoom on 2000, in 2021, <laughs> but I'll undoubtedly talk to you. A votre santé, Irene. Take good care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.